I'd like to welcome you to St. Croix Central School District's uh, regular Board of Education meeting, Monday, October 21st, and the clock says 7.01, so we'll start with our first order of business. If you'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next is our roll call. Uh, Mr. Hugh and Mr. Redmond are not with us at this time. Uh, all of the members are present. Was the meeting properly notified? Yes, it was. Okay. At this time, we have an opportunity for public comment. Do we have anyone who would like to speak? Yes, Linda yeah. Ross. Could you introduce yourself? And, I will. Uh, I had some other people here with me, but there was some confusion, so they went home. Anyways, I'm Linda Ross, and I'm a paraeducator here. Um, I've been with the district. This is my third year. Um, I'm the first year that I've been here. I think it's been four years now. Two years ago, in our meet and confer, we had discussed the possibility of forming a uh, professional development committee and out of that committee we worked closely with Pat and um, the powers that be that are forming the professional development days in hopes that more of the professional development is relevant and um, parents feel like they can see themselves in those roles um, it's still a work in progress it is doing wonderful um, it's wonderful to have that voice in that process though we also then started working on the job description. Um, Pat had asked us to do that. And um, we came up with our collective voice as to what our roles and responsibilities are um, as paraeducators in the district. We went from a job description that was literally three sentences, um, two of which that don't have anything to do with what we do nowadays. Um, so, we just wanted to say thank you. Um, our process um, was ongoing over the whole year. And um, then we kicked it back to Pat. And Pat took all of those roles and responsibilities and took all of our voices and put it back into something that was one page because our roles and responsibilities was three pages. And we wanted something that would be more fitting for job descriptions that, that you would send out for um, when people apply for a new job. And so, again, we want to say thank you for the committee that we were able to form and want to continue doing the good work. We'll be working on the handbook next. And so, again, thank you and thank you, Pat. Um, okay. She's been working wonders around the building. So, thank you again. Okay, is there thank you. questions for our speaker? Just on behalf of the committee that the meet and we're um, really happy that what happens in those meetings can turn into something more meaningful. We appreciate the input that you had at the meeting and following up with the, with the administration. Well, thank you. Thanks. It's been fun. And it's fun to get other people involved because normally I think that without that process, um, we, they went good and involved and feel like that job description really is that. So I think it was well worth the time and the effort. And thank you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else with public comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, then we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our highlight on youth, and we will start with the SEC virtual education presentation by students and staff. So, welcome. And that podium's adjustable. There's a button on the right hand side lowers and raises yeah, I should be able to show me good. You want me to start? Sure. sure. All right, uh, I'm Calvin, Calvin Heinel. Um, the reason that I chose this program was traditional days at school are roughly seven and a half, eight hours. And going to the virtual program, it's only four. So I can work and still have time to do homework and other things after school. Hi, I'm Noah V. Brock. The reason I chose this program was because I had a friend in here. Um, she said it was great, so tried it out and haven't looked back 
sense. Um, it's helped me get through college, my senior year of high school. So that's a plus. Um, my name is Devin Minder. I got expelled from the Baldwin Woodville School District in early 2018. During this time, I had multiple problems in my life, such as depression, grieving the loss of my grandma, and allowing drugs to influence my decision. After the 2018 summer, I realized that I had thrown away everything and I would no longer be able to attend any public schools. They wouldn't even look at the changes I've made or consider having me in their school because of the simple fact that I had been expelled from the previous school. In late 2018, my mom contacted the SEC Virtual Academy and my education has been saved ever since then. The SEC Virtual Academy has helped me so much in the past year and a half. Without it, I wouldn't have been able to stay sober or keep pursuing my high school degree. The program gave me an opportunity to continue my high school education when nobody else would. And because of it, I was able to get a whole year ahead going at my own pace. I'm now a junior, finishing up my last three requir required credits and getting ready to start work on co college courses. I wouldn't have been able to get above a ninth grade IQ if it weren't for this school. I just wanted to thank and appreciate everybody who was a part of this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we just wanted to do a quick update on enrollment and where we're at. Uh, last year at this time, we had 103 students open enrolled in. This year we have 156. So we're up substantially with those students. And then resident students, we had 20 last year at this time and we have 26 this year. So we're up 59 kids from where we were last October which feels like a really good game for us. So yeah. and kids like, like these boys, you know, doing great things every day. So I just wanted to touch base and let you know what's happening with the charter. So. For tracking purposes, mm -hmm. is do you consider everyone on, on pace to graduate and, and in a, maybe not in the time that they may have otherwise, maybe earlier, maybe, maybe later, but everyone, is tracked as to their their pace they are and they don't all finish on the four-year track mm -hmm. we know that going in sure. a lot of those kids come to us are so behind that we're doing our best mm -hmm. to get them done in five or six if possible so um we do the best that we can for those for those kids and most of them are on track but they can so. see light at the end of the tunnel even if they're mm -hmm. on a longer than four years yes yep mm -hmm. we we allow them to work over the summer you know we really don't take a break to try to give them the opportunity to finish out and get that diploma. Okay. So. Well, I guess I had a question for our three gentlemen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, hey guys, you're <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know the three of you uh, are enjoying the program. Uh, have you thought about your future plans and what do you uh, want to do after uh, you finish uh, the academy with the diploma? Yes, actually, I'm going to be attending WITC in New Richmond to do uh, body and chassis repair and maybe small engine. Uh, I'm attending WITC and I'm going there to be an accountant. So hopefully that checks out. My goal is to get a few college credits in high school and then go to U of M and something in the mental health department. Okay. Yeah, nice work. It takes a lot of courage to come up and speak in front of a bunch of people, too, so we appreciate that. We have one more joining us. Oh. I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm so sorry. Um, my I left late, and which is pretty on brand for me. <laughs> and my map brought me to the wrong location, and then I can find a parking spot. This has been quite the heck of a day. Um, so uh, before I get, start, uh, get started, I just wanted to thank you guys for um, first allowing us to have a, um, an online uh, system. This has worked really well for you guys, and it's worked really well for me. Um, and Stephanie and Autumn are both absolutely wonderful. Um, they have 
the best. I love them dearly. Um, I am uh, both a quote unquote gifted student and a quote unquote problem student. <laughs> I've been labeled as both. Um, when I was in elementary school, I was in the gifted system. Um, and then in middle school, um, things changed. I changed. I went through a serious bout of depression and derealization um, that basically made me feel like nothing around me was real. And this led me to not do very well in a school setting. <laughs> so um, my grades dropped and very quickly I saw a change in how the people around me treated me and how the teachers, um, staff treated me, how my parents treated me. Um, my grades reflected to a lot of people how I was, my worth. And obviously that's not entirely true. We shouldn't be viewing people like that. But um, that's how it is in a school setting. And the teachers are um, concerned when they see someone um, like them or like me that has lower grades maybe. Um, so I needed a change. Um, so I entered um, freshman year of high school with a new focus. I had started therapy. I was um, feeling better, not 100 up not 100%, but um, I was doing better. Um, it's still, stuff still wasn't working for me. Um, I was feeling better mentally, but in the school setting, it just wasn't working. I couldn't turn stuff in on time. Like I mentioned, I'm not very punctual. <laughs> so um, while my uh, test scores were still high, I still wasn't able to get stuff in on time. So my dad came to me at the end of um, sophomore year, and he said, listen, there is a system that I hear about online school and I think it would be a good idea for you. And so very, very last minute, I decided to do it. Um, and it, quite frankly, it saved me. Online school has been fantastic. I would not be where I am without it. Um, it works very flexibly. Um, so what I've been doing this year is I've been doing um, my classes in a block system. So um, I'm doing my classes one at a time instead of focusing on like six classes at once, which is fantastic. I'm a senior now, to be fair. Um, and uh, it's just, it's been absolutely wonderful. It's very flexible. Um, and there is no penalty for, um, or minimal penalty, I should say, sorry, um, for turning stuff in late because the dates are so flexible. So that works really well for me because I'm functional, or I'm not very functional, excuse me. Um, but it also works really well for students who are working. I have a friend um, who is also in online school and she's currently trying to balance her school with her work. Um, and so there are some days where she just straight up can't, can't work on her schoolwork because she has, she's scheduled to work. Um, and so for kids like that, where work is their number one priority, online school works fantastically for them. And for me, while I'm trying to get back on my feet still, um, this is a really great way for me to sort of get back into the swing of things without having to deal with the pressure of public school. And um, so yeah, um, I didn't say my name, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, uh, my name is Matilda Leeson, um, I'm a senior. Um, uh, that's about it. So I want to thank you for um, allowing us to do this, allowing me to do it, allowing these boys to do it. Um, it's helped us a lot. Um, and once again, Stephanie's been absolutely fantastic. Autumn's been fantastic. St. Croix um, Central High School has been fantastic. I transferred here from New Richmond. Um, and I still, this year, I'm still participating in some, some of New Richmond's activities that they allow me to. I'm in the school play, which is part of the reason I was late. I was coming from practice. Um, uh, and I am allowing, I'm also, all of us are allowed to participate in uh, stuff through the high school, as I'm sure you guys are aware. Um, so we've done some field trips. Um, I toured two colleges, which was awesome, um, through the, um, the online school system. And that was fantastic, because I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna be honest with you, I wouldn't have done it. Otherwise, I just wouldn't have been able to find the time. Um, but that was wonderful, and that got me started on the path to finding my colleges. So um, this system has allowed me to um, really kind of heal from the stuff I went through in middle school, and um, it's given me lots and lots of new opportunities to better myself and um, to get ready for the future, which is really um, what we should be striving for for all of our high school students.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I thank all of you. Uh, yeah, it's uh, great to hear the uh, how well you're doing. Uh, you know, I was a hope that the, uh, the school board uh, gave the okay to start the school, uh, that we would uh, be able to help the uh, develop an opportunity for the unconventional students mm -hmm. and give them an opportunity to uh, complete their education. I know our board has felt for many, many years that no student should be left behind. So we're glad that you're doing uh, successful work and we hope for the best for your future. So thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the next item, we have a presentation from our SCC TRAP team. So, welcome and congratulations. Well, thank you for having our team in. I'm going to let these guys start out, and then I'll finish up and, and fill in any any gaps or any blanks so they can introduce themselves, and then we'll have some of the rest of our team stand up here. So, so I'm Kelton Roseboom. I'm a freshman this year at uh, the great University of Minnesota. I am studying animal science. And on behalf of the SEC TRAP team, I would like to thank you for giving us this opportunity to share what our team has accomplished this year. Um, I've been on the team, I was on the team. I'm alum, I'm a great alumni of St. Croix Central now. So yeah, I was on the team from 08 to 2018, so 10 years. And uh, it was a certain highlight of mine to participate and represent our school and community. Since its beginning, the SCC trap team has seen countless successes from individuals shooting perfect 25s, 50s and even greater, we strive for excellence each and every time we head to the line. We allow our members from 6th grade to 12th grade to join. Hunter safety training is required and we shoot 20 and 12 inch shotguns. From the inception, the FFA trap team has worked to stress three important principles in the following order. Safety, this is our number one priority. It has always been and always will be. Uh, secondly, we want our members to have fun. It is a great to post a good score, but if you're not having fun while doing it, it's the score won't feel as good. And third, marksmanship. Uh, learning to be good marksmen takes time, lots of time, and we continue to get better each time. But if you fail to promote safety and you're not having fun, the score in the end won't matter as much. Page two. <laughs> We are unique in the way we have both a fall and spring season. Members can letter in both after meeting some basic criteria, such as posting weekly scores, shooting an average of 19 each week, and not incurring any policy infractions. Now I'm going to turn it over to Brock Thorson to discuss our spring 2019 season. Hi, my name is uh, Brock Thorson, which was already mentioned, but uh, I would like to share some of the highlights of the 2019 spring season. It uh, started out really strong, even though the weather kind of kind of hindered that through there. And uh, we had a lot of members who posted a perfect score, which is 25. And uh, some we even went on to post two or three. We are awarding we award top guns each season in the spring. The following were our award winners: seniors Abby Betcher and Ashley Mann, juniors John Miles and Dylan Sweet, and freshmen Ethan Betcher. Ethan <coughs> also managed to shoot a 50 straight in the beginning of our fall season. Uh, top Gun Middle School went to me with a 22.7 average. Top Gun High School went to John Miles with a 23.5 average. Top Gun Female went to Abby Pesher with a 23.3 average. And uh, Top Gun Male overall went to John Miles with a 23.5 average. Uh, top 10 in Conference 4 male was uh, myself in 6th place, Ethan Pesher in 4th place, John Miles in 3rd place, who also was the who is a conference champion for the male. Top 10 in conference four female, uh, Ashley Mann in fourth, and Abby Betcher in first, who was a conference champion in Wisconsin. 
State High School play Target League Top 10 in Wisconsin. We've had Abby Betcher in third place for overall and John Mountain in fifth place overall. State tournament proved our bet our best showing showing data. We not only had Ethan Betcher and John Miles placed in the top ten individually, we we placed second overall in the varsity varsity um, competition, I think. That was an exciting time to know that the hard work we had that the hard work we had all paid off, put in paid off, in order in order to qualify for national tournaments requires a higher higher level of performance. As a result, we had eight members make that happen. Of those five, were able to compete as a team and individually. Kelton Rosebloom, Eddie Betcher, John Miles, Ethan Betcher, and Brock Thorson posted some amazing scores. Once again, the countless hours of practice paid off. When we when we achieved a 14th overall national tournament in Michigan, it was a great honor to bring that back to Wisconsin as we as we were also the highest Wisconsin team. It's sometimes fun to know that other teams go hoping to be Sanker Central. We are honored to represent both, of, both our community and state and take up and take our role and keep the place and keep that place seriously. <laughs> Hello, I'm Abby Betcher. I'm a new, a new alumni. <laughs> and I have been, I was on the drop shooting team for my sophomore year in high school until last year, being the senior year. And it was really exciting to watch all of our athletes improve each season and watch their confidence grow and their scores get consistently better. We really could not have done it with all with all the people that put in countless hours as volunteers, coaches, score, scorekeepers, mentors, and supporters. A special thanks goes to all the individuals that really worked hard to really put this team together and to make it as competitive and again, like the number one team that, that, I managed, that finished for Wisconsin in the national competition this summer, which includes Jeff Thomas, Steve Weber, Mel Warren, Greg Betcher, Dave Thorson, and thank you to again to Mary and Bowden for being wonderful with our social media as well and River Falls Sports Wing Club that allows us to do the sport that we all really love. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. So, so, as much as some of our um, shooters back here don't like to speak, I think that's one of the nice parts about doing all this. So it gives them a chance to to grow not just in their marksmanship skills, but their ability to present to a group of individuals, thus giving them that many more, uh, what I call soft skills, workplace skills, which I think is really, really important. Um, we just wanna say thank you to the school board and to the community for continually supporting us in this endeavor. It's not a cheap endeavor. Um, it's pretty pricey, if you can ask any of the parents sitting back here, um, the cost of not just acquisition of a firearm, but the countless number of shells that we, we tend to go through uh, usually on a weekly basis, uh, not just boxes, but cases. Um, and if you've ever purchased a case of shells, you know that those can, can get pretty, pretty pricey, but uh, they definitely come, the, the members come forward each and every week with a desire to really want to do better and to improve their scores. And even if they're not doing as well as they want, they come back that next week with a happy face on again and go at it again. And I think that's kind of a testament to them as well as to all of our, 
our volunteer coaches. I couldn't do this by myself. Um, we didn't mention Pam Miles. Uh, she's she's kind of one that really helps get our messaging out. She does a great job communicating with our team, um, making sure that we're where we need to be, when we need to be. Um, I don't have enough hours in the day to do it all. So I certainly appreciate her and all the help that she's given us along the way. Obviously her, her son, John, is on the team. He's actually taking night classes, so he could not be with us to, to join us. So he's actually furthering his his interest in maybe more of the social services side of things, but we're pretty excited that he's doing that. Um, but she's gonna be leading us, and I think we've already recruited another person uh, right here to, uh, to, to pick up some of those reins. What we've got up here is um, a team photo. These are our, our state individuals who helped get us to second in state. That's the highest we've ever placed in state. Um, that's at a varsity level. Um, we were basically one or two clays shy of hitting first. And I have a feeling we've got some members back here who are gonna really give it their all in the spring to, to try to get to that number one spot. With regard to nationals, it's a phenomenal experience. That's all I can say. It's pretty awesome to watch all these kids. It's amazing. This is our national team. Like I said, they're all here um, except for um, Ethan and John. Um, Ethan will be around for a while. At least I hope he'll be around for a while. The plan is for him to kind of take the helm a little bit too. Um, but we've got some amazing young shooters back here. And I know that uh, we've got a bright future ahead of us. So you're welcome to uh, pass these around if you want to look at them. Otherwise, they're going to be at the high school. Um, we're going to try to get these displayed somewhere in the walls so that we can continue our tradition. Just like all of our other awesome sports teams, we're going to continue the tradition of representing our uh, our members on this team as well as we can. Just out of, just so if you've seen this, every one of these patches, like here's, they're all like all 25. There's a 50 on here. That's in a roll. Mm -hmm. So this is Brock's. This is how many perfect rounds he had. And Brock, what are you, a freshman? As a freshman, this is how many he has on him. I mean, I showed you the skill set. Wind, weather, everything is a factor. That's how focused you have to be. And like I say, Brox is pretty impressive what you have here. Ethan and John, they're just flooded. So I mean, it's. To make it best. <laughs> Seriously. Each. Maybe. Yeah. And see, by the, by his, by, yeah, by their senior years. And they'll both tell the exact amount of patches yep. they have. Yep. But that's just a testament of how committed they are and how perfect they take it. I mean, you know, as an, you know think of wrestling as an individual sport, but you do it as a team. You know, you compete individually. How many of them get a perfect score yeah. that many times? You know, just, just so if you see them, that's what you understand what they are. It's impressive. I, I couldn't. I couldn't either. The only time we do not go to the line is in lightning. So it, it could be hailing sideways, and they have to be on the line shooting. And that's pretty impressive. That's really impressive. I've sat under the nice little canopies keeping score and just saying, golly, I'm glad I'm not out there trying to keep my shooting glasses clean and my you know, ear protection in while being able to still focus on that clay coming out of any direction out of the house. We want to encourage all of you. Uh, this is our last uh, week to shoot for fall season. So Thursday will be our last score night. Currently, we're in first in our conference. I don't think we're probably going to lose that. Um, we would have to pretty much post no scores at all on Thursday for that to happen. Um, it, it's, it's quite a testament um, to, to where we started and how far we've come. So, yeah. If you have any questions for our members, you certainly can fire away, no pun intended. I have one more comment. Actually. Yes. Yeah. Matt, did you stand up for a second? Um, pull for Greg. I'm Greg. <laughs> um, I have stage four cancer. <laughs> and uh, He's been a coach of ours for yep. five years, six years? Since the beginning. Since the inception. Yep. Uh, my trap shooting family started this awareness, I guess we'll call it, and the support from each and every one of these people has been absolutely amazing. <laughs> we call ourselves a family for a reason. Yeah, we do. We're, we're a family. So if this didn't exist through the school, we'd still do it. Because it's it's grown more into, like, like I'm saying, family is the only word I can use. And the support has been, and from the school too, from St. Croix Central, the whole school. 
has been so impressive. Um, and I'm winning. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to congratulate all of you. Uh, I've been following it for quite a while now. I get reports from my cousins who have kids that uh, compete in, at Menominee and Ellsworth. Uh, they feel like they're doing very well, but they're always chasing St. Grace Central. So. <laughs> and we like to keep it that way. <laughs> so, no, it's it's phenomenal. I, you know, I'm just following the, the shooting of how many 25s in a row is 50s in a row who, uh, 75 in a row, you know, or going 100, 200, you know, 100, 200, uh, just they don't miss, uh, you know, seeing the difference of what a, a miss of one or two and a one or two in a, in a, in a flight, um, it's phenomenal, so. For instance, we had two shooters at the state tournament shoot 99s, and Ethan took third and John took fourth. Four. Shooting at 99. So, yeah, it, it, if it's you miss one, and one takes you, it doesn't take you out of out of it, but mentally you have to sit there and tell yourself, I can't miss. You know, you can miss a tackle in football, you can miss a spike in volleyball, but if you miss one target in trap shooting, it can put you out of the run. Yeah. So, it's, but, uh, it's a mental. You know, just there. Just their ability to recover after a miss is phenomenal. So uh, I want to congratulate all of you for the wonderful, uh, wonderful performance, and I'm hoping at the very least uh, you're having fun with it. And glad they're uh, learning firearm safety. That's that's an important factor. That's why safety is always our number one. Always will be. Won't ever change. Uh, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Congratulations, and I hope the success continues. So. And you can follow our team. Uh, we actually have about 350 followers of our team on Facebook. Uh, with the the national coach follows us. Yeah. Who <laughs> actually recognized, I was at a gun fair in, in Minnesota this fall, and he actually recognized our team right away. <laughs> so um, St. Croix Central is definitely on the map shooting sports world um we are the target of every school in the state of wisconsin right now um and uh, at the national level we have a lot of people that, that have part of our team and, and come up and approach us and talk to us um this team has had national range safety officers come up and compliment them not only on their um accuracy and how they function on the gun line but the safety practices that they follow as well both on and off uh, gun range um, that doesn't happen very often most of the time when your range safety officers approach you it's to to tell you need to make a change uh, we have been approached two years in a row about how well uh, oil machine our team is uh, and how safe they are and how how they follow all of the uh, trap etiquette rules to a T. Um, and so they, they get complimented at that level. Um, these kids, um, a lot of these kids are not traditional athletes. Um, you know, they, they, they may never be able to, to be successful on the football field or um, on the softball field or baseball field, but um, they, they perform at an exceptional level um, on the track field. And we have an amazing uh, group of coaches that are able to take these kids who have an interest and move them through the ranks to, to perform at a national level. Volunteer coaches. Yes. Um, so we actually have a coach that is uh, one step below an Olympic coach. Um, that, <laughs> that, that's the level of coaching we have. Um, and, and all these people are, are uh, volunteers. But um, these kids uh, just put their heart and soul into this and really, it, it is a family because people don't drop their kids off at the gun range and uh, pick them up when they're, they're done shooting for the night. They're there the whole night. We have grandparents there. We have aunts and uncles there. We have siblings there. Um, it, it is a family event and everything we do, we do as a family. When we go to 
nationals. It's our it's a family vacation for the five families that are there for nationals. I mean, we that, that's how we approach it. We we do everything as a family. Clearly, the coaching and family support is there too, and thank you all for that. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. These are the things we truly like to do. Moving on with the next item on our agenda, our comments from our uh, board members and superintendent, starting with an update from our communications planning committee. So, committee? Sure, go ahead. We're, um, we finished our next communication postcard. We finalized it today, changed one thing. Um, and it has all the dates for the conferences and things in December, so we think we're then going to wait and put another one out. Um, Put it together during December and January, and we'll put it on January. Uh, but it looks good. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, it gets, has Veterans Day programs, the school play, and all the holiday concerts in December. So, thinking we don't need to have a December one. This one's really going to be November. We'll come out in this week, perhaps. So, yeah. So. Updates on general school, like the um, the enrollee in and out, and the safety grants are on there. And then we decided to add the um, Holiday Angels. Added Holiday Angels, so that, that was fitting with the rest of it, timely, versus our top 10 goal. That, uh, that was more geared towards the community of they want to support okay. our kids and families. Okay, anything else? No. So thank you for doing that, and uh, look forward to reading the next uh, communication uh, postcard. So. Thank you for doing that. Next is an uh, update on our uh, staff appreciation bagel breakfast. Uh, John is not here, but uh, I'd like to thank him uh, for helping gather that, uh, all the information and taking care of that. Uh, I think everybody got the note from John of what we owe him uh, for that. and so. I know he won't be here at this meeting or the next meeting, so if you could maybe drop it in a mailbox to him, um, that'd be appreciated. And I think it was well received. I, I've seen a couple of had a couple of comments and thank yous from uh, staff regarding that uh, breakfast. And I don't know if anybody else heard anything. So okay. Moving on to the next item, uh, we have a presentation from our Can I just team. make a, uh, take yeah. a point of personal privilege and honor? Uh, last week, uh, my son Tom received the Presidential Award of Excellence for uh, math teacher. So it's the highest award that an educator can get. And so he was in Washington, D.C. So oh, nice. one, one teacher from each state. And so he was a representative from Montana. No way. Cool. And he teaches first grade. He doesn't yeah, teach that's math. Great. <laughs> so pretty cool. Yeah. Really congratulations, Tom. Good for you. Congratulations. He works hard and he loves teaching kids. You know, I've talked before about him being a student of how kids learn and you know, and he's really acknowledged as a uh, educator of educators. His sort of special uh, thing is something called productive struggle mm -hmm. where kids you know, struggle to <laughs> solve problems rather than just giving them the formula and he's really he's actually spoken at uh, national math teacher conferences on that so kind of cool they get this recognition so oh, hey, cool. pretty neat congratulate him for us st. Croix central 
Yeah. <laughs> and St. John's, actually. John is here, but Frank. Two more minutes. Okay. Next. Next is our high school marching band presentation. Welcome. Hello. Is it HDMI? Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Sean Conway. Uh, this is my third year teaching high school band in the district, uh, fifth year overall. Um, with me, I have uh, senior Grace Hansen, who served as our drum major for the marching band this year. Um, we wanted to take a little bit of time to tell you, um, and I'm sure you probably noticed that we've done a couple different things with the marching band this season, um, and wanted to kind of give you a bit of a highlight reel and a bit of a summary of some of the, the successes that we've had and some of the great things that our, that our students are doing. Um, so to kind of start here, uh, very, very brief history, kind of the way things were when, when I first got here to sort of set the stage. Um, the band program, the way it was set up and still is largely, is that there were uh, two separate classes set up for marching band. There was the third hour band and then third hour freshman band and the sixth hour uh, sophomore junior senior band. And which is great, that works perfectly fine for us in those situations, but when it came time to learning the field show for homecoming, it presented a bit of a challenge when you had a quarter of your kids in one class that had no idea what they were doing, and all of the other people that knew everything else somewhere else, and you had to try to put together a coordinated production for the entire community um, with those two groups not meeting. So we ended up using homecoming as that week um, in all the other like chaos and celebrations and recognitions that we have as kind of our way to get everybody together a couple times to be able to learn that you know freshmen bless their hearts like I, I just think we remember walking getting all of them set in their spots walking over to a different section trying to get them set up and then I turn around and they've all walked away and they're talking with their friends again so you can imagine how like being able to have some of that upperclassman leadership there uh, was um, very much desired. Um, another part about that was the uh, marching band was at the time a required class, which has its pros and cons. The pro is that the ensemble is huge, uh, but the downside is you have some people that are, you know are there but are just not interested in doing a field show thing like they love band, but they just don't care to be out on a football field. And that's totally okay. Like, I would much rather have, um, you know, marching band is a short part of the year. I don't want to sacrifice someone's love for music by requiring them to be in something that they despise. Um, but the other challenge with that, if it being required, is uh, the first year I came in, uh, Colin Nelson was the quarterback and was also tenor sax player in the band, and he, you know, for the first part of the year, like he didn't learn the show with us, and we didn't push him to learn the show because when halftime came around in the homecoming game, he was going to step off the field anyway um, because he had to go to their halftime meeting. Like he wasn't going to pull the starting quarterback from from that for our field show. Um, so with that in mind, we wanted to take a couple different steps to be able to see what we could do to push this forward and, and, and take it to another another level, another step um, for us. And so um, some of the reasons that we wanted to do that is just like the history that we have of um, marching band in our community and just kind of the tradition that we have with that at our schools. Um, you know, when Mr. Helmick was cleaning up cabinets, he was able to find a whole bunch of old pictures that I've been uh, scanning in. But, you know, we can see Old uniforms formations, I believe that one on the right, uh, bottom right is in uh, Glenwood City in the parade, and then the one on the left is in, is that the elementary school now, mm -hmm. I think? I don't know, but. Uh, I could have been the middle school. Or the middle, middle school, school stage. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's been a large part of who we are as a district, and, you know, it, it, it is one thing that I wanted to be able to bring us back to as like kind of another point of pride for us as a, as a district. Um, the other part of it is the community engagement that we get with having marching band. Um, I often tell the kids that 
the biggest crowds we're going to have all year are going to be at those Roberts and Hammond uh, Community Day parades because marching band is the only concert unit that we have that's mobile. Basically, everything else is passive. Like we have to get everybody to come to our concerts um, or come to like if they want to see the pep band get pep band, they have to come to a game. Like this is the only chance that we have to go to where the people are and kind of represent our school in that fashion musically. Um, the other reason is it's, um, for, for band, it's one of the best things you can do for kids. Um, because you have a ton of different opportunities for um, a lot of students that, you know, some are very good in sports, some are not, and that's okay. We take all of them no matter what. Everyone is a starter, everyone has a role. There are no bench warmers in marching band or band in general. And the other great thing about this is students get an opportunity to, um, you know, give up a little bit of themselves, a little bit of their personal, like their, their, their individualness to be a part of something greater than they could achieve um, by themselves. And so I think there are a lot of lessons to learn in that in addition to um, the value of having everybody working and pushing towards a common goal um, and, and working to achieve that together. So. In addition to the opportunities we have for student leadership um, with like Grace uh, and some of the other seniors that we've had to be able to lead their peers, which is not necessarily a situation they get in too many other curricular classes. Um, so taking steps forward, this year we moved a lot of things around. First, we had to solve the schedule issue. So um, we removed band from being a required class. So we had to provide an alternative. So students that did not want to be in band, they were, um, or did not want to be in marching band, signed up for the fall wind ensemble class, which worked as just like every other curricular ensemble. And in fact, we had a concert on uh, October 6th. We were able to get three concerts, uh, three pieces put together. And I'm working with Mr. Helmrich to even see if uh, at the middle school, we can find a way to collaborate with sixth grade band and make that an early season uh, concert for those beginning band students um, and also find a way to tie in a way to, that uh, students can be involved in band and other activities as they go through school. Um, so that's opened up some really cool possibilities for us. Uh, but the other thing that's helped with this is thank, thank you to the uh, Dino for making the schedule magic work. Um, but we were able to get it set up where uh, band was either fifth or sixth hour, which means for whatever the student had that um, fifth hour, opposite of that would be lunch. So during the school year, what we just did actually today is because we don't need to do band, uh, marching band all the way until January, it's a little too cold, um, that allows us the flexibility to hit the end of our performing season, transition students into the great bass ensembles, freshman or symphonic band, and then begin working on our music for the upcoming winter concert. So we're able to not really lose a beat at all within there, and we can make adjustments as we need to um, throughout the year. So that was a huge thing. Um, the other big thing we did is we wanted to make sure that what they were doing was seen as important and valuable. You know, when we pick out football uniforms or volleyball uniforms, you know, we're not looking for last year's thing. We're looking for, you know, we want to put our kids in the best stuff that we can find. And so we found a kind of affordable way to do this. We worked with a uniform design company and we were able to get this. I'm going to grab the Grace's got, it. I don't think we'll ever model it. But, you know, we were able to get um, something that kind of represented our uh, kind of the old school colors but also be something that isn't going to be heavy in wool, that'll work in the summer for us. It's machine washable and easy to take care of. Um, and has some other cool little highlights, like capes and things, you know. And also that when they wear it and they put it on, they're going to feel really good about what they're doing. Um, so we were able to do that, I think, really, really well. Um, after that, we also had outreach. We got a Facebook and an Instagram page going. I don't know if we're as popular as the trap team yet, uh, but you know, we're working on building that um, and using that as a means to 
connect with uh, parents, community members as well about concerts and other events that we have, our meat raffle that we have, or our burger night, excuse me, that we have on November 4th. Um, so trying to use that as a way to build um, our group. And then also we had, um, it seemed really weird to do all of these things, take all of these steps, try and do more, and then not give the students more opportunities to perform throughout the year. Um, so there are a number of, we're actually in a very, very good place for this kind of situation with River Falls, Hudson, and Baldwin all around us, and even with Cumberland, just a little bit farther north, um, to get the chance to perform our show a couple different times. So we actually went to um, Baldwin Woodville, hosted a marching band festival that we attended and performed an exhibition. And then there was also the bigger contest that we went to, which was located in Minneapolis, Minnesota at US Bank Stadium, uh, where we performed our, our field show. Sorry, forgot to skip through this, but we also make t-shirts, so if you want one, let me know and we'll can point you to our store. Um, so some of the cool things we were able to do this year, here. I don't have enough for everybody, I'm sorry, but you'll, so you'll get to share and pretend. But what I have here are kind of, I have the little coordinate sheets that kind of show where you're supposed to go on the field. So when we're talking about some of the, uh, you know, weird ways that you can have literacy in the classroom, the big picture packets that you guys have, those are. So, big packets you got. Those are the pictures that every kid gets. Those are what the uh, on the field, you know, that's what they're doing on the field. The little paper sheets, you can see at the top, it's got a letter and a number highlighted. So that would be like A7, that would be your person that you're supposed to, supposed to find on those pictures. And those words there basically give you your coordinates on the field. So if you haven't had any marching band practice before, this might be complete gibberish to you. But as you can imagine, for the last couple of years, this has also been complete gibberish to a lot of our students. Um, but we were actually able to make significant uh, gains in that. So with the 40 students we had, we not only learned how to uh, decipher all of these coordinates, all of these sheets, um, and that also lines up with all of their music, <laughs> by the way. So they're coordinating three or four different things all at the same time. Um, my first year we did three, chart, three charts here, this, and then go back. The year after that we formed five boxes, moved around, and then wrote SEC. This year, the kids learned 37 total pages of drill, which completely blows away anything that we've done previously. Um, we've also gotten, you know, I happened to find a VHS tape uh, where they unveiled the last time they got new uniforms, which was 1992. And so that makes uh, 27 years for new uniforms, since new uniforms. And um, I've heard this was I think uh, Director Hugh mentioned that he had talked with you uh, or somebody that they hadn't been on the field since like doing a show, like developed show since like 1983. So somebody might need to fact check me on that date, but then that puts us at 36 years since we've done anything like this before to this extent. Um, and then the other great thing, um, I'm not sure if you want to chime in at all, but when, like, when we were out at these events, um, uh, kind of the atmosphere and the way the kids carried themselves was uh, very, very exactly what you want them to do to represent our, our schools and our district. Um, I know I was very proud, especially our first time out of the gate with all of these things. I don't know if you want to chime in or um, encourage it, it as a parent in this situation. It was just, I, don't, I mean, just talking to my son, like after just performing that halftime show, just the adrenaline, he was so pumped up and excited and then this U.S. Bank thing was I mean it, it kind of was unreal when you were there doing it but it was so exciting and they were just so into it it was snowing and so freezing cold and they were in those uniforms listening to Mr. Conway just intently like they were so excited to do this it was just a wonderful experience and I got choked up yeah I'll be honest it's really amazing 
in a short story, I think you were on his interview committee, right? Mm -hmm. yep. cool. Yes, I was. <laughs> so, to see, to, so to see you go up there and lead with that vision that we had is, is amazing. And so, um, Patricia talked about the snow a little bit. So the U.S. Bank Stadium event, we were at the Youth and Music uh, Competition. Um, we were one of 35 participating groups from all across the upper Midwest. Um, you can see us warming up right outside of the stadium there. Um, <laughs> when we were warming up, she was not kidding, it was 33 degrees, 13 mile an hour winds with gusts. Uh, Board Director Hugh was actually out there um, directing buses and traffic. Like, he loves this. It's actually killing him, I think. I mentioned I was doing this. It's killing him that he's not here. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. So that's about marching band for a little bit. Um, and yeah, light snow. And I would say the community too. So we were practicing and Hudson was practicing and Baldwin was practicing and they the groups waved to each other but then they all sat and supported and watched each other it was that part was really awesome too it, we weren't competing against them we were all you know were for each other yeah. i thought that was wonderful yes so kids got to like walk through the tunnel step onto the field i don't know how many of you are viking fans but i always like going there um, and then on the field with the pro numbers with the, the Viking and everything. The kids were a little upset that I didn't let them know ahead of time that there was going to be a video camera and a jumbotron in use. So that kind of caught them off guard a little bit there. Um, they got over it pretty quickly. Um, and then this was kind of what uh, Trisha was referring to. But uh, you can see there on that top picture that um, Every, every every festival that happens, they do a drum major retreat, and so they bring out uh, basically every group that's participated, and this was actually only half of the people from the day, and you can't even see all of them on there because I'm stretching so far in the field. But it was just really cool the way that it worked out that we were able to get from left to right on that top picture, Baldwin, Hudson, um, and us lined up. And Grace may not have been the tallest one out there, <laughs> but she was definitely the last one you would want to pick in a fight. <laughs> she, was, she was intense. Yeah, it was so cool. Really hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to make sure to have Grace here was not as just like a thing to make sure that like I'm staying calm through this whole thing, <laughs> but uh, Grace was actually recognized as a scholarship winner from Youth and Music. There were, from the 35 bands, there were 110 total applicants, and it was limited to seniors only. Um, and Grace was selected, uh, one of the eight uh, selected from uh, that whole host of, host of groups. So she earned actually a um, $500 scholarship. Uh, I don't know what the parameters were to be. To further music education, so I could use it for um, college or for like lessons. Yeah, so um, I wrote an essay for Youth in Music about how music has kind of shaped who I am. Um, I talked mainly about our SEC band program. I've been here since the beginning, sixth grade, so six years now. Um, I definitely will say that Marching Man is the coolest thing that I have been involved with, um, and I've done it all. Like, I went to Disneyland last year. Um, I've been in all our jazz ensembles. I've done honors band and all of them. But definitely, um, marching band is my favorite thing that I've done at SCC so far. And yeah, I'm really honored to be a part of it. So thank you guys for supporting me and yeah. What instrument do you play? Alto sax. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Cool. And you're going to do music in college? Yes. As a, a major or just participant? Or? I think I'm just going to participate. Um, my passion is writing, which was wonderful for just being an essay based <laughs> <laughs> um, But I'm definitely going to continue with music here on my own. Do you know what school you want to go to yet? I'm going to UW Eau Claire. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> we watched them perform there too. They were very exciting. Yeah, yeah they had, that was kind of a mind blowing thing for the kids because Eau Claire's marching band is now up to 475 people. So it was really funny to tell them that there were more more kids in that band than there were in their entire high school. <laughs> that was a bit of an eye-opening thing for them. But uh, 
I also do want to take another another minute to like just recognize how outstanding and fantastic Grace has been as a drum major for us this year. Um, to be willing to take a complete and total chance on something like this, um, really not entirely knowing which way it's going to go, trusting that it's going to be at least okay. Um, and there were a lot of times where uh, we didn't realize how green we were in some situations, but instead of you know, getting into those situations and tensing up and shutting down. She was just like confident, bold, went for it. Like we went over how to do a salute maybe 15 minutes before she actually had to do the salute. <laughs> and you would have you would have thought she was just doing it for her entire life. Um, she was kind of the emotional and emotional role model for all of the people there and definitely demonstrated what we want everybody else to be when they come through. Like she said, it's very hard for for what drum majors to come will have to be. So I'm extremely thankful for you being in that spot. I'm trying to, she's our first then, right? Like since 83 or whenever that was? Uh, first in a different role than it was in the past. Okay. Yeah, I would say. First in this, first in this new, this new way of doing things. Yeah. My first year, Monica and Michaela Vassar um, were carried over from Jason, mm -hmm. um, but I still helped conduct with things last year just to kind of get a clean slate for everything and start fresh. I just did it all myself, and so it was, it was a little bit of a like a nervous <laughs> handing it over. But I was Grace was like the one person I was not nervous about handing that over to at all. So. Um, on the pun, but kind of the next steps, the things that we're looking to try and do as we go forward um, is we really want to continue to build on the success that we had this year. Um, kids, like Trisha said, kids were on a high coming off the field after each of their performances. Um, you would have thought, I told them we had snow days for the rest of the school year after they saw Eau Claire and they were heading home. They were singing jingle bells as we walked back to the buses. They were just so jazzed from everything we were doing. It was unbelievable. Um, and because of that, they are invested in increasing the number of people involved. They've already talked to me about trying to find a time to go down to the middle school and talk to the eighth graders about getting in it and um, really kind of building that connection there. Um, we've got to continue to update some of the equipment that we have. Getting the uniforms and things taken care of was a big step. We had to play a lot of money ball. Like we we're lucky that Baldwin uh, bought new uniforms that had gray pants, so we were able to buy their black pants for like like pennies on the dollar almost for the whole thing, which was awesome. But they also came and helped us in other ways, like the white sousaphone you see in the picture. That's actually one we're borrowing from Viking Middle School because we only have two, um, and we had three tuba players, which I wasn't expecting to have that problem, but it's sweet. Um, we're looking at uh, additional performances. Uh, the kids wanted more chances to perform, so we'll see what that looks like and where we maybe go for those things. And um, continuing to develop a student leadership program kind of within the organization, within the marching band that can um, not just influence things that happen in that one quarter of the year, but then those leadership skills can transfer to what they do um, in their regular concert bands and then some of the other activities that are involved in, you know, trying to make it so that, you know, how many how many more Grace Hansons can we have in our group, basically, and how can we continue to develop that, um, those qualities in, in students. Um, so, yeah, I uh, have this too. If you want to see just a little bit of what we did, I can jump, you don't have to watch the whole thing, it's not super long, and I know many of you saw it at homecoming, um, but I will just jump towards the end where we get through a little bit farther through so you can see the stuff where we do a little bit more moving. So.
that's also Grace conducting all of this. I have nothing to do with the um, He's right there pacing on the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> perspective for us, Eau Claire had 475 students in band, and, you know, compared to the number of students in the school. Also, first, or the last field performance you were thinking was about 83? Yes, and that's what John Hughes did. Okay, so to also keep it in, per in perspective for us, what year were you born? <laughs> 1990. Do we plan on maybe more than once a generation for the field performances in the future? I mean, is that something you're thinking you want to continue? I mean, maybe not an every, every year thing, but to me, it's... I'd be okay it's, with doing that more than once in my lifetime, yeah. I'd say castle. Well, I also think to put it in perspective, we have to realize that back in 83, we had one band teacher for the entire school district. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's That's a lot too. Grace, did we do anything? So I was actually a drum major in my high school band. We had 150 in our um, band, and they sent me to drum major, the Big Ten drum major camp. And uh, did we do anything like that to help you? We didn't do that, but um, I probably wouldn't have been ready for that. In all honesty, I had no idea at all what I was getting into. Um, I knew I would be directing, but other than that, I had no idea. Um, so my version of that was pretty much band camp, and it was really kind of cool to learn alongside everyone in the band, just kind of realize that we're all on a level playing field and we're all learning together. So there was no like, I'm a singer. It was just, we're all in this together. We're gonna try to make it as good as we possibly can. Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations on your scholarship <laughs> and the award there, Grace. And yeah, awesome. Sean, uh, Congratulate you and uh, thank you for the getting the band, marching band, up and rolling again. I know Dave Larson worked real hard to try and 
get a marching band put together and his struggle always was trying to get enough musicians to participate and they would sign up for uh, parades and day of the parade half of the band wouldn't show up <laughs> so that was a struggle and having three sons uh, all that were most of them are pretty good athletes but it was always a struggle to try and keep them involved in band but uh, they not only had fun in band but uh, they also were able to drag some of their friends other athletes in have a good time too. So these are. I'm, a, I'm very appreciative that we're getting the program up and rolling again. So these you. are way more detailed sheets than the ones that I had when I was. Uh, what what the computer can do on that stuff is awesome. Like they can even show, uh, like the, the images of the people, like with their legs moving and everything on the computer wow. while they go places. Like it's, it's pretty unreal. Sean, did you buy the show or did you write it? Uh, I did, so all of the music that you guys heard, that was, like, we found that on, like, the music store, um, but all of the pictures and formations and things that they did, I wrote that. You wrote that? Awesome. Yeah. I just want to say thank you, because from the parent of a kid that's not super into team sports, this is, you know, a team sport that he absolutely loves. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I think your success will, <clears throat> will feed into more success and more kids will. Well, there's a buzz at school. Yeah. Good. Yeah. You're school. doing it the right way, Sean. And the daughter wants band gear, so. <laughs> Good. Yeah. And by the way, if you want, <laughs> River City did not mean it this whole yeah. time. But uh, River City Stitch has been really cool. We got sweatshirts, uh, hats, and hats for when it gets cold out. So, which it seems to already be no rain. RiverCitystitch.com and then just search Yeah, the SEC bands. Um, otherwise, if you find us on Facebook or whatever, I'll blast that out again soon. Or you can always email it. Um, whatever. So, yeah. Thank Great. you guys Great. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank With that, we will move on to our next item on the agenda, which is our financial reports. Starting with our treasurer's report. Bank account balances as of September 30th, 2019. Citizen state checking $271,896.79. Citizen state bank money market $3,023,145.08. Citizens Money Market Fund, $46.52.35. Citizens State Bank Money Market Suicide Prevention Fund, $18,564.82. For total bank account balances of $3,313,659.04. Okay, are there any questions? Do I have a motion? Do accept the Treasurer's report as presented. Second. I have a motion, Kirk. Second, David. Approve the Treasurer's report as presented. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is our consent agenda, which consists of approval of our meeting minutes for our uh, September 23rd meeting, our, August, or our October 7th meeting, approval of the bi-monthly bills, uh, for uh, October. Approval of retirement resignations. Uh, Rachel Anson as our full-time high school uh, uh, track and field assistant coach. Approval of uh, contract uh, modifications and appointments. Uh, Carol Boydish, four-hour uh, middle school housekeeper. Kyle Hils Hilstead from a seven and a half to an eight hour middle school housekeeper. Teresa Soboda from a six to a seven and a half hour middle school high school housekeeper. Ron Seiler as our full-time C team boys basketball coach. Justin Yaron, our full-time high school track and field assistant coach. Rachel Hansen as our full-time high school track and field head coach. Uh, Shannon uh, 
uh, cyber as a seven and a half hour elementary special education para uh, Erica Canal as our seven and a half hour elementary special ed para Sean Augustuson uh, seven or six and three quarter hour elementary special ed para I also have an uh, addition of Alicia Benzer as our full-time middle school play advisor, uh, effective October 22nd of this year, as well as approval of the student participation in the early college credit uh, program for spring of 2020, which is your exhibit 10E. Also approval of the curricular modification request for students to enroll in full-time and part-time virtual ed courses for 2019-20, which consists of two part-time and one full-time student for a total of three. Move to accept as presented. Second. We have a motion, David. Second, Scott. To approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to the next item, which is our student enrollment update. For October, we have 1,601 students in seats. We have 156 students enrolled in our virtual uh, charter school, as Steph mentioned previously. 156 as opposed to 103 this time last year. And in addition, we have 26 resident students full-time in our virtual school. Uh, with that said, our open enrollment in is 275 kids versus out 109 for a plus net of 166. Okay, any questions? Looks like our virtual charter school is uh, quite successful. So. Mm -hmm. I had some families moving in and out based on the seats. In seats, in. yeah. Down seven students. Yep. Okay. okay, any other questions on uh, the student enrollment update? Okay, hearing none, we'll move on to the next item, our key work of our school board, starting with our staff's uh, student and community recognition. Unless you want to read it, Kurt. So, uh, recognition of Jeremiah Hubbard. Thank you for choosing SCC Elementary for your Eagle Scout project. Due to your commitment, hard work, and time, the children are enjoying the two Gaga pits you installed. Me and the children of SCC Elementary thank you kindly. For Heather Wester, great work in deciphering and reporting detailed and accurate student enrollment counts for both the August summer school days. And the third Friday count, your work is critical to our funding process and DPI audits and your commitment to excellence is very appreciated. For Amy Bahada, great work in design. Same thing, sorry. <laughs> Heather Wester and Amy Bahada, but same thing. Uh, Lori Kress also for that. I suppose I should put them all together. In one. And also Tammy Worth. And Pam Katner, Jen Kleschel, Kim Gunderson, all for the same thing. Sorry, <laughs> but it helps if I read ahead. Uh, Logan Kimberly, congratulations to you and your coaching staff on qualifying for the Girls State Golf Tournament and <coughs> the Girls Golf Team. Congratulations to the Girls Golf Team for qualifying for the State Tournament. Okay. Result of the Girls Golf Team uh, ended up taking third place in the State Tournament. So, congratulations to them. Mm -hmm. Thanks for taking care of that, Kirk. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for submit, uh, submitted those uh, <coughs> recognitions and uh, so forth. So we'll uh, look forward to the uh, submissions for next month. So. <clears throat> okay, moving on. Uh, next item is the update and discussion regarding our SCC uh, Soccer Exploratory Committee. I think we met at least twice, if I re remember, uh, the previous uh, board learning meeting uh, in September, I believe, we had a request from several parents about the possibility of uh, starting a soccer program at SCC. Uh, we formed an exploratory committee, uh, took 
pick up several items. Uh, most of the homework that we needed uh, was completed pretty uh, rapidly. Um, I guess I will defer to a couple of the uh, board members that were there. I know Tricia was there for one, and David and Scott were there. Um, I think yes. our, our goal was to understand participation numbers, likely participation numbers, and they did survey. Um, that went down to fifth, fifth grade, fifth grade and through eleventh mm -hmm. grade, and um, on the chance of offering it for next year, that would be our seniors. Securing space, making sure that it was viable with, with, um, or at least securing the, the the ability to have the space to practice and, and host games, and then the um, viability numbers wise of having a boys and girls program. And the surveys uh, came back with good numbers that, that suggest viability. And we told the committee that the, the parents and the advocates for the um, for it, that we would talk to the board and uh, the committee would recommend to the board that we move forward. Okay, comments, David? So that's about it. One of, one of the things in this to make sure everybody's clear, this was a, an additional survey past the first one that they that they had done. Um, this one was much more thorough, I think. One of the concerns, I think one of the biggest concerns for some of the, the students, and especially parents, was the draw that soccer would take away from other sports, the number of students it would. Um, and the survey really just found that this was not the case, mostly because the seasons are flipped, girls and boys, versus when some of the girls and boys sports are happening. Uh, we just did not see, um, especially from some of the students that go over some of those other sports, we didn't see them pulling out of the other sports to do soccer instead. It was in addition to. Uh, I think that was one of the big concerns that it would decimate some of the other sports programs if, if we offered soccer. Uh, and that really wasn't the case. No, it, it, from what I saw, the survey results, it was showing that we would be drawing more kids that aren't participating in sports programs at the present time into a sports program. And so it didn't seem to be drawing away from our current sports, but adding, adding to. Any other comments, Trisha? Nope, I think you pretty much said it all. It was kind of nice to know that we already have kind of some areas that would um, be available for them to practice in and, um, and looking at, then it's just, you know, getting that kind of stuff down. So it's exciting. This is kind of the perfect meeting to talk about this too because we've been about <coughs> how we offer opportunities for kids. Right. Trap shooting, marching band, soccer. If you don't want to play football and you don't want to run cross country, should you not be able to do anything? If the numbers are there, we should, we should support it. So. And I think the one thing that we talked about was the money it would take for the startup and supportive program. And I think we're far enough out in the, in the budgeting process that um, barring any issues there, I, I think we can come up with, with the money. I think we were talking somewhere between forty dollars and $50,000, I think, to get this thing up and running. And then uh, much less than that to keep it running. And that's for two sports seasons. Yeah. And that's a boys' side and a girls' side on yeah. opposite ends of the of the calendar year. So it's not for a sport. That's yeah. and there seemed to be in the survey enough numbers that we would be able to not only field a varsity team but also a JV team. So it doesn't require a lot of a lot of students to create a soccer team, right? I mean. No, but these would be teams, uh, probably 15. Yeah, I think they said they field 11 and more than 17 or 18 on a team is actually a little cumbersome for them. That gets to be too many. The state says you can have, I think, up to 25 on a team, but it's too many kids for a, a lot single team. team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and and everything, everything looked good. You know, they had the students saying that they would participate, and, and uh, we've got, I think, Plenty of volunteers, especially in the, the committee members that, that discussed it about volunteering time. You know, we looked at structuring it the same as the other uh, the other sports, um, as far as coaching, staffing, numbers, 
making sure we've got the supervision there. Um, there's a lot of ideas I think that came from some of the parents on how we can use some facilities that are already here for doing some things to try and save some money. Um, and, then, and that would meet meet WIAA um, rules as far as some of the other things, or playing fields and, and things like that. But, and I'd like to give kudos to Jason and, and the parent group for identifying the criteria that we needed to address and um, they pulled together a survey, they, they put it out to the right people, they followed up on everything, they answered all the questions that we had, they came up with questions that we should ask and it was a, it was a very passionate group with a lot of organization to it. So. Yeah. yeah, so I guess at this point uh, we would have a couple of things to do is a have the uh, board support a resolution to uh, adopt soccer I guess we would be looking I think at this point seeing if it's possible to get it started possibly next fall um, and then we would also have to work out the, the budgetary constraints that we're looking at a recommendation to move forward then uh, if we need a formal adoption that would be at the next meeting we could do that in the next meeting so i think i don't think we need a motion to move forward i think we just need to make sure that it's feasible and we can afford you know do the budget and if all those things are worked out we'll prove it at the next meeting yeah or two meetings whatever it takes uh, so i was pleasantly surprised with how Quickly, everything was vetted. You know, just one. You know, I think Jason had to talk to WIA yet just to notify them. That, you know, just to make sure that that we don't miss a deadline or anything correct. like that. And then the rest was logistics and by budget. And if we did it for next fall, can we get in schedules and all that kind of stuff? Yep. It sounded like the most difficult part of it is is getting it into the middle border conference schedule because it sounds like there might have to be some real alignment for the middle border. It, it, it wasn't really an issue for us. It was a team that might have to get moved out of the middle right. border because we're, we're in the middle border and they have soccer teams that are um, Cumberland or Hayward that, that might have to realign somewhere. I spoke with our conference commissioner. We're a middle border school. We, we would have a problem getting in. It would be more likely asking some others to move if necessary. But is that, I mean, would they do that next fall? Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. He's well aware and he's a full support. And they'll still get them a schedule. They aren't, they aren't going to be left out. Right. But they're just. Completely the, different teams. And they'll be our non conference schedule anyway, because you only play each middle border school in conference once, and you might play them twice a year for your non conference schedule. So. Good work. Okay. So if, if it's, we're not going to formally adopt it till next month, uh, it's the wishes of the board then that we move forward with this. Yes. Check the budget out and uh, go for formal adoption next month. That's good. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And we will proceed as such. Okay. Uh, The next item on the agenda is a preliminary discussion regarding district needs and priorities. Um, one of the things, uh, there seems to be some rumbling somewhere of a referendum in our future. Uh, we're not even as a board sure that's the process to go through because we don't even know what we're looking for. I think that not put the cart before the horse. Um, we're looking for a preliminary discussion of what does a district actually need? Uh, facilities, staffing. Um, compensation. Compensation, uh, financial uh, needs uh, from uh, the district uh, for the programming uh, and such. And it's hard to start that discussion, uh, but we need 
to get it started so we can start uh, looking at this uh, stuff and uh, get a get a wish list, a wants list, a needs list together and try once we have that list established um, what are the next steps we have to do. Um, there are many steps uh, involved in this especially if we're going to uh, move forward and uh, have success in uh, achieving what we're looking for. And I thought tonight if we could get started in that dis some of that discussion at least our thinking caps on of what, what do we need and also uh, this would be something that we might visit during our retreat uh, coming up in uh, November as, as board members and uh, so on and so forth so we're always looking uh, you know to give our students the best opportunity that we can and uh, make good education uh, trying to treat our staff uh, fairly and also make sure that our facilities are up to snuff to handle the programming needs that we have. So um, I guess I don't know where to start, who wants to start. Um, I can start from the wage and benefit. <clears throat> you know, we've, the board has been pretty um, supportive of the 110% of the average for comp i think we've realized just economically with the state funding we're never going to get there unless we do some sort of excess levy so i think that was the genesis of it um, some of the early discussions <clears throat> um, you know you can do a perpetual excess levy but then how much do you ask for because the what the wage and benefit has been talking about is to maintain the 110%. It's not going to be 2% a year. It's probably 4% a year in comp increases. And the, uh, how do you do that in perpetuity? And, you know, one of the things that we talked about was why don't we do some sort of a blended thing where you could do some capital improvements in the early years that when that, those projects were done, that money would be available in the subsequent years to fund more and more pay increases so that you could have, you know, go out 10 years and say, hey, we've had this um, compensation model and you can't do a compensation model and every year wonder whether or not you're going to be able to afford it. You want to go to the team and say, here's what the board is supportive. It requires community support, pass a referendum, and here's the commitment that you're willing to make to your employees. The, um, you know, we've had remember the meeting John Tackman says you know Jeff you've been leading the teacher negotiations for a long time and the board now expects teachers to be excellent but you're pretty open that you are paying at the average CISA level and like that's not right so you know I think the board reacted appropriately and said no let's we developed the 110 percent objective but realistically, I mean, it's not something that we can um, ever fully achieve without an excess levy referendum. So that was kind of the genesis. And I think the discussion needs to be, well, what other things do we need that we might, so when we go to the community and say, hey, you know, we have this objective to be a top 10 school, we're going to achieve that. We want to make sure we keep it the teaching staff and the support staff that have caused that to happen um, they deserve to be compensated fairly and competitively so that we really get the best teachers and staff in the area and we have the support and facilities so community here's what we're asking you to do so that's where we, 
need to, and now we need to do, as we've done in the past, it's like an internal assessment of what we think, and you can't do that. We've never done that at least in my short 21 year history on the board, we've never done it without talking to the community. And really doing it kind of against my better judgment, we've had community task groups that were consensus based. It wasn't you know, a directive from the board, but we had community meetings and this is what the unanimous recommendation of the community um, committee that the board ultimately so I do think there, we do need to engage the community. They're the ones that have to vote on that. So, Tricia? Um, not talking about that, but just last time we heard Pete talk and then we heard Shelly. Pete mentioned buses, right? Buses are getting old, but then now they're, they're developing more. So it, is there room in that bus garage, Pete, if you had to add more buses to, to accommodate the new building areas? Or is that bus garage full too? So that's full. So if we had to add more buses to to accommodate these new areas, I mean, that's huge. And you said the elementary school and accommodating that the before and after school care, that it's like that's bursting at the seams. So I think we've got definite needs in a growing district. Well, I, th I, th I think there's a, a couple of things that you know, we, we've had come before the board that gifted a talented program. Uh, we've been looking to figure out a way of getting an additional staff to support those students. And we haven't been able to afford that because we have other staffing needs that seem to crop up as a higher priority. Uh, that would be, you know, this would be a method of trying to accomplish that part of it, but also look at additional staff we need at the high school, middle school, elementary school. Um, another thing is we, um, when we passed the last referendum, we looked at moving the, the 4K program out of the daycares back into under the roof of the elementary school. And at that point, it was not um, feasible based on the additional price. Revisit either you know, is it feasible to continue to add on to that building um, or to get the uh, facilities we need, or is it time to you know, look at a second facility? Um, I don't know. You know, it's those are still things that we need to consider, and we would definitely need community support. Of the success last year, as we did after we uh, brainstormed with our uh, community group, uh, we went out the uh, survey with uh, from the Morris Leatherman Company and uh, gauged the community support um, of what we were looking at and possible financial consequences of doing so. Um, that would be something that we probably want to do again. Uh, it definitely set some uh, limits as to what the public was willing to accept and tolerate. Um, but at this point, it would be way too premature. You know, we can't just ask them a blank slate of questions. Um, you need to have some guidelines of what you're looking at. And right now, we're just in the beginning discussion any others here that have any other things that we should be looking at all of these things be thrown out on a board uh, and vetted so. I mean realistically Kurt needs to put down on paper what his space needs are going to be for the next 10 years and his staff needs and so does Pete and so does Shelly and I mean if we need 14 classrooms where do they go Virtual school is bursting as well. Right now, they're housed in a. Uh, well, it was a storage room behind our library, so they're. That's something. We need to yeah, I mean, there's. I don't know what your needs are, but they're there, and they're coming. There's more coming when you look at the enrollment. You're losing a class of '94 this year, and you're not gaining a class of '94 mm -hmm. next year. 
just to clarify my point was that virtual school may need to be looked at off site. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the space needs are yeah. a comprehensive look needs to happen. Just in terms of the virtual school, uh, Glenn talked to me about that a couple of years ago. However long you've been here, so it's longer than that. <laughs> so it was just last year, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and he had actually talked to Citizen State Bank because the basement of the bank was available and was, you know, and that was considered as a and the bank, you know, that was my newspaper office and they almost gave it to us for free. I mean, it was a very reasonable price. So, yeah. No comment, Stephanie. And I don't know what the answer is, but you know we've spent millions of dollars on buildings, and I'm just something I think we need to have the when we survey the community and talk to the community. I would hate to see you know, and every time we said, well, we're going to do a building, but you know we're going to ask them separately to do an auditorium failed one time or we're not going to ask for an auditorium I just I have a personal concern that we maybe need to go to the community to support our people capital but our biggest asset is our people and, and the chances of losing a referendum because of you know one more building thing not that we don't need those things I just there's a balance there and I think we really have to make sure that um, we get the support I'm not sure how that works, but I don't think you know we can, we can do the, the facilities um, referendum and the operational budget referendum on one question. Well, but if we if we no, you can't. But what we had talked about at the wage and benefit is that. X million a dollar. Let's say we're do ten million dollar excess levy, which we never would. But let's say it's two million dollar excess levy, and we only needed a million of it to fund the wage part. That gives you a million bucks to spend on capital improvements. For and then you would you would spend a million dollars each year until you needed that million, and you had those projects done. Then you can't. You can't borrow money except with a bond referendum question where you do a levy that's separate. And you can't do an excess levy connected with building a new school as part of the... Can you use a, an excess levy that's... Uh, you have to earmark it for... No, you just, for you were just it's operational, but is that... It would be in the way that questions were right. so okay. the question would be worded. I mean, we so wouldn't you say would it's a specific that. purpose. It's a resolution. The other, the other <laughs> important factor of getting this done right are the new rules the state has put on to go forward with a referendum. You know, it used to be if you passed a resolution that was 45 days when I started on the board, then it was a 70 day window. Now they're telling you you can only do it on the regularly scheduled elections, which would be the primaries and the general elections. Both primary in the spring, which is usually February, the nonpartisan election in April. Um, you can do the primary in August or the general election in, in 
November, but the November election is not held every year. So you've got probably uh, you know, six chances in uh, two years to have this uh, referendum. The other important factor in that is if you put forward a referendum and it fails, uh, probably I, I think the way the rule's written is you can't come up with it for at least two if not three years. So you can't, come, the, you can't keep coming back to the citizens anymore. So you've got one shot at it. And if it fails, then you, you're going to have to live with the consequences for uh, that period of time. So that's why it's important to get the work done up front and get the support up front before you uh, propose this. And then there's the one more factor that if you fail, you get frozen at your low spending limit, which is what for us, $750,000. Yeah, unless it's 498000 it was okay. for times our current enrollment. Because we're at 9700 next year, we'll go up to 10000 for right. times 1,600 so, kids. We won't do this before next year. Right. And then where, at what point are we to that tipping point? Well, right now it's just a two year biennium, so they went to 9,700 and 10,000 for now mm -hmm. until, until the next biennial budget. That's but are we to at, be determined yet. That's a catch up thing, right? So are we still a, yes. low, are we still a low spending district at average. that point? Correct. Okay. I think it's 10,300 is the average. Yes, I saw. So we need, you know, this is why it's important that we have uh, these important discussions up front because if we fail, if we propose this and we fail, it's not just, oh, we'll, we'll wait till next time. There's some real financial consequences for missing this. So, and I know some of the, we've been getting feedback from some of the staff members that they're a little frustrated that uh, we're not immediately going for a referendum in the spring, but I do not think they fully understand the financial consequences if we fail and uh, we're not just blowing it off but if we're going to ask for something we need to know definitely what we're asking for and what the consequences are uh, both pro and con so I guess at this point I don't know that there's anything more we need to discuss at this point I do like we Scott's need to get our comment though about kind of starting that wish list of hey this is the facilities that we you know the needs and wants if you will i mean it's, it's at least a 12 month if not an 18 month planning process for any referendum if you want to do it right so i guess yeah the, the question is what's step one just yeah. starting with your internal wish yeah. list yeah. yeah and i think we can do several things at once but one of them is okay there's in the next two years after graduation plus is we have 55 more kids in high school two years from today than we do right now. Does that look like our building or does that look like something else? And then what follows that? You know, where do they, how long before it starts to maybe take a little dip? Because we do have a couple of bigger classes that are on the horizon here. So I was thinking facility study would be one part of it. I met with the company last week that does that for free. Facility study, you know, understand. They do it. They do an interview where they understand your facilities, and I, I, just in a half hour, he understands the, the twenty-four million dollar referendum and eleven million dollar energy investment, and the two million dollar energy investment. We're sitting pretty good in that respect. But there's always needs, but they could do a, like I said, a study, working closely, obviously with Greg Green. That'd be facility study, enrollment projection. You know, just just like the last referendum, right? Mm -hmm. And would we? We haven't gotten the applied population surveys updated for a couple of cycles. Is that, is that seen as worthwhile or not? Oh, most definitely. I think if this, but if we do it, we'd have to do a not just a polish it up. A full, there, no, I, think I think we'd have to do the full no, line. Because the last time it's... they didn't bother talking to all the clerks to get. Is anyone building? How many yeah. building permits? Yeah, they came up with a number without without asking if any new houses yeah. have been built. Yeah, we had to do that on our own. Yeah. So, but that was getting an update instead of the yeah. 
full of things. And then the more I slow them and survey, can't say enough about how. Mm -hmm. But you can't but really that do that but that's until you have a stretch mark of what you're thinking about. Yeah. So I guess at this point, uh, if we can start gathering ideas, uh, hoping that we can get this uh, done, at least we could start looking at a wish list, uh, hopefully by a retreat, which would be the second weekend of November. And I just want to mention too, like, I mean, it would be far smaller numbers, but as we get more and more students, we should possibly look at increasing budgets for like STEM areas and CTE areas are going to have more students and, and more things going through. So those things would need to increase budgetary to accommodate. Yeah. So there's many things that we have to vet. There's many things that we have to look at to consider. And even as administrators and board members, uh, there are still probably wishes, concerns, needs um, expressed by some of our parents out there, community members. And we'll need at some point to hear those also, right? Yeah, we haven't, we had a pretty comprehensive list of staff we would hire if we could hire them. And we got three out of 14 or whatever we got, you know, I mean. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is, you know, we looked at a 10 year plan for facilities and that was based on not having any significant changes in uh, enrollment growth or anything like that. And, uh, we continue to grow and continue to grow at a pretty good rate. So that's something we have to revisit also. So, so at this point, I guess if we could, uh, you know, possibly start having our administrative team put their wish list together of the need for staffing needs, uh, facilities needs, uh, programming needs, uh, and wants. Uh, the board members can yeah. have things that they know of that should be added to that list. Uh, see if we can start compiling this stuff and see if we can uh, get through once we have a list developed, then we can start prioritizing uh, what is important and where we have to go to get more input if we don't feel that we're getting uh, the whole picture. And so I know Pat, you probably have needs and wants also, so you'll have to put that away. <laughs> so, so that would go to all, all the admin team start putting that list together and uh, give us a chance to start looking at it and considering and vetting and prioritizing and uh, go from there. But if we're going to go for this thing, let's see that we uh, cover the needs that are necessary to have the district function at the high level that we've become accustomed to. So, Okay. So that's going to be an ongoing discussion. So if we can get something uh, thrown together by uh, you know, the 14th, 15th of November to start with, but that is by no means uh, any definite hard decision. Because this is something that's going to be discussed for several months. So if we miss something, uh, we'll still be able to add it. So. OK, are there any other questions or comments on uh, start of this discussion. Hearing none, then we'll move on to the next one, which is our board retreat planning. Uh, hopefully everybody has had a chance to fill out the uh, survey that Lee had sent to everybody and get that back to him. He said uh, three of you, and I'm sure you know who you are. Three have, of you need to return it yet. I haven't done it. I sent so, it to him. You did? Okay. That okay. was this, this morning. So that, that he is going to use as a basis of uh, starting our discussions for the retreat. And so your honest input and true feelings uh, are important. Uh, let us iron that out. And, uh, yeah, he wants to cover you know, general things and uh, comment across all boards, but he also wants to tailor a little bit. So I'll talk to him about this facilities planning and dedicate a little time um, to discuss the 
discussion of that. Or there's else the survey gives you an opportunity if there are concerns or things that you feel that need to be addressed either at a board level or as a district level. Uh, survey, we can hope to get that in there and get those discussed. It's going to be a worthwhile day, day and a half time spent. So. Tim, do um, you have the questions that you can forward to me to make sure I get them? I do. Then I'll do it tonight or tomorrow morning. Okay. okay. Then a reminder is I believe we are meeting uh, what, 5 o'clock for dinner mm -hmm. at Pier 500. Adjourn from dinner and reconvene over at the Fit Center um, in Hudson uh, to start a discussion. And then we will, I think by 10 o'clock that evening, we should finish up and we will reconvene uh, Saturday morning at the Phipps again at 8, 8 a.m. So hopefully we'll be done around noon. Well, it's important that we're all there. Said that you've had it on your schedule, so I greatly appreciate that. So these are not easy things to put together. Any questions with regards to the tree? Is there an idea on where is a good idea to park? Hudson. Yeah, so they now are updating the meters to. Yeah. The, but in the but evening, they don't do meters in the evening. Was that the little park, park right across? Right across the street in front of the beach is. Beach down there, the, by the bull. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough Friday night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we'll do it at 3 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they do meters on Saturday either. No. So I know the parking in Hudson is always an issue. The so. meter person is like a meter Nazi. She looked and saw that I had three minutes left and came back four minutes later and I got a ticket. One minute after my meter expired, I was there two minutes later. <laughs> it's consequences. You know, and I, it cost 50 cents an hour, 25 cents an hour or something like that. You need a better watch. I know. They are um, going to tear down the St. Croix EMS station And ultimately, they're talking about putting a ramp. So they yeah, much better so. service for the community. They moved them up. We won't get into they that one. Yeah. Okay. Behind, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah, I if there are any updates with regards to that, and, uh, try and do our best, but I think getting there by uh, 5 o'clock or a little earlier mm -hmm. be a little easier. Crowd hasn't hit yet. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the next item, which is discussion of the updated job descriptions as additions to the SCC employee handbook. Can I say something about the handbook? It was brought to my attention that we changed the language on our internal posting email, but the language has not been changed in the handbook. It says first consideration on page 67 three times. Okay. So we took out the word first. Yeah. And so I don't the know, emails that the has, difference between first consideration and consideration. I, I think the I think that old language left over from years. when there were unions, you know, Correct. union yep. con so first it's consideration. Irrelevant. Right. But it's um, yeah. It's sticking in some it ways. Yeah. And a practical stuff, but the handbook hasn't been updated yet. Yeah. So people need to be patient. Yeah. So. Handbook works both ways as well. We don't always enforce. Uh, I was just in sending the message. <laughs> just sending they don't have a problem with. <clears throat> yeah, I'm well aware of that. It's probably the same person. Okay. Um, then we are back to the job descriptions that were presented. I know there were 120 pages of descriptions. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody has had a chance to go through them. I know I didn't 
I got to maybe half of them. Um, well, about two years ago, you asked to separate yeah. them out of policy. So, so yeah. I'm working on that. Um, so it is just uh, not necessary for board approval unless you really want it to be, but that was the reason you want to take it out. So we can change them fluidly and update them as That's applicable. And um, yeah, a lot of work by a lot of people in the district to, to get that updated and developed. So, yeah. and with that goes these job descriptions that are in policy that need to be eliminated. Well, but there still are about a dozen job descriptions that mm -hmm. could be developed, mm -hmm. which I think I have half a dozen of them yet. I had a long list. Okay. So what action needs to be taken? I guess what we're looking for is do we want to take these job descriptions, um, essentially what we're looking at is a possibility of adding them to the employee handbook and uh, then the, the, removing removing them from district the district policies. So for, for agenda item A under 13A, do we need a motion to move them to the employee handbook? Or is this just a informational, we don't need a motion until we get to B Correct. where we're gonna remove them? That's my understanding. Okay. So. We, we don't want to approve the job descriptions, but the policy, it is in policy, so I'm wondering if you should have a motion to take them out of the handbook. Yeah, that's B. So B is B is the removal of the policies. Right. So do you want to? Do you think there's a separate motion to move them from policy to a handbook? We rewrite them. Well, they're we not a policy though. We don't. I, I we think so. Policy. I think Kurt's right. We're moving them from policy. We just say we're removing okay. them from yeah. the policy book. Right. Do they need to be in the handbook? And then do we need to revise the handbook if we change a policy? Yeah, I don't the, know why they would be in the handbook. Not the thinking, handbook. This is an actual job description handbook in itself. It'll be its own standard. Well, it's just that and we don't just not, not, the the employee <coughs> not the employee handbook. Not the employee as additions to the SEC. Originally, that's where the lawyer told us to put it. I did out not. of the policy book and put them into the hand, employee handbook. But okay. what you would do is you'd have right. one page. Each handbook would be unique to the job then, right? You'd give the housekeeping handbook. No, I, I would just recommend that it be part of the handbook. It's just an old standalone. Yeah, it seems manual. to me like the job description should be its own binder. Yeah. And the, this the references go to the job description binder, and that references go to the binder. I agree. Then we're not revising a whole entire doc. We can revise the few pages that need it if they need to revise something. So the handbook would have a reference point to go to for job descriptions. See. Job description mm -hmm. handbook. 